mawawasto Magdaluyong narito ako Para ang galat na lahat na pulo Magiging muong na buo Pagkakaisa, pagsulong, narito tayo Para sa pagwawasto, pagdaluyong, narito tayo Para ang kalat na lahat na pulo Magiging muod na buo Pagkakaisa, paglaban Pagumpay sa ating bayan sa daibigan Paglaya ng sangkatauhan Narito tayo Para sa pagkakaisa Pagsulong Narito tayo Para sa masang ating Pilipino Narito tayo Para ang kalat-kalat na pulo Magiging muog Narito tayo para sa pagkakaisa Pagsulong, narito tayo para sa masang aping Pilipino Narito tayo para ang kalat-kalat na pulo Magiging muong na buo Ito ang dakilang misyon ng Pilipinong proletaryo Good afternoon, international comrades and to our migrant kababayans. Magandang gabi naman po sa inyo dyan sa Pilipinas. Mapagpalayang pagbati po para sa ating lahat. First of all, Nakbayan Europa offers its deepest condolences to the family and friends of Manny Kamani Sarmiento who passed away on the 11th of December this year. He worked in labor unions and national democratic mass organizations in the Philippines and continues his service to the people in Austria where he had been living for the past 16 years. Kamani was patient and supportive, especially to the youth activists and new migrants. As Migrante Austria chairperson, he worked closely alongside Anakbayan Austria in many of their joint events. While we mourn this tragic passing, we vow to continue his work as a Filipino activist from Philippines to Europe. Kamani dedicated his life fighting for human rights, leading by example to show that no matter how far from home, there is always a way to take part in the struggle for freedom and human rights. Salamat po, Kamani. Our most heartfelt gratitude to you and your service of the Filipino people. <clears throat> again, welcome back again to the National Democratic Online School. We are now on our second episode of our Mao series. So if you have missed any of our episode, you can check it out sa aming Facebook page, Alakbayan Europa. Today, we will now discuss uh, another mouse idea, which is on the correct handling of contradictions. So get your families and friends para sa isang namang kaaraw ng pagkatuto at diskurso. So if you have questions to Tito Jo, please just drop it on the chat box or on the comment box. So later after the discussion, we will have a question and answer portion in which Tito Jo can answer your questions. Ano? Tito, let us start the discussion po. Uh, please welcome uh, ILPS Chief Emeritus, Tito Joe Masison. Tito, mapulang pagbati po sa inyo. Kamusta po kayo? Mahalab na revolusyonary pagbati sa iyo, uh, Kang Hello, at sa lahat ng ating tagapakinig. Ayan po. Alright, Tito, ano, uh, without further ado, let's start na. No? Let's dwell into our topic. No, In our last episode, we discussed mouse on contradiction. 
No, today we will dis discuss naman on the correct handling of contradiction among the people. So Tito, can you please provide us the context of the time that this speech was delivered by Mao? Mao wrote on the correct handling of contradictions among the people in 1957. Uh, China had won total victory in the People's Democratic Revolution in 1949 and passed through the period of consolidation and rehabilitation from 1949 to 1952 and had carried out the first five-year plan for the basic socialist transformation of Chinese of the Chinese Army from 1953 to 1957. Mao pointed out that uh, um, there were still classes and class struggle in China. The class contradictions among the people are non-antagonistic and must be handled correctly so that they do not become antagonistic. The term people encompass the basic toiling masses of workers and peasants and the middle social strata including the urban petty bourgeoisie and the national bourgeoisie. There were contradictions among these social classes and strata as well as within every class and within every stratum on ideas and methods of developing socialism. At the same time, there are antagonistic contradictions between the people and the counter-revolutionaries. There must be clear evidence against them for criminal activity so that mistakes can be avoided. There are only a few counter-revolutionaries because of the achievements of China in socialist revolution and construction. Criminal activity of counter-revolutionaries or enemies of the people must be differentiated from the free and honest expression of ideas and views among the people. I see. Dito in this speech, ano, Mao tackles the contradiction that existed um, even after the party has seized political power. No? One such contradiction is the contradiction between the national bourgeoisie and the working class. So it is one between exploiter and the exploited. And is by nature antagonistic po, hindi ba? And how can this be transformed into a non-antagonistic one in the transformation towards socialism? Uh, before 1957, the national bourgeoisie, uh, uh, there was a state policy to accommodate their investments and entrepreneurial and managerial skills in joint state private corporations and to allow them to earn dividends according to their investments. But in 1957, there was already a policy for the national bourgeoisie in the joint private corporations to receive fixed interest. Mm -hmm. on their investments and no longer dividends as their share of corporate profits. Contradictions involve differences regarding the disposition of the profits of the joint state private corporations and the role of national bourgeois entrepreneurs and managers who were retained to run the enterprises efficiently. The national bourgeoisie had a dual class character. It retained its exploitative class character and yet complied with state policy of socialist industrialization. There were contradictions arising from the dual class, dual class character of the national bourgeoisie, but they were non-antagonistic and could be resolved through non-antagonistic methods, such as discussions, reasoning, persuasion, and education. The policy of the socialist state was to integrate the productive assets and entrepreneurial and managerial abilities of the national bourgeoisie to dissolve the national bourgeoisie with its exploitative character in stages and to prevent it from increasing its exploitative character. In the meantime, the socialist state made sure that the profits made would be divided for the following purposes, fixed interest payment to the national bourgeois, improvement of the wage and living conditions of the workers, accumulation fund for the expansion of the enterprise, provision of social services, administration, and tax for the state. The Communist Party and the trade unions made sure that the rights and interests of the working class were upheld, protected, and uh, promoted, first of all, even while the entrepreneurial and managerial abilities of the national bourgeois were available, subject to their re-education in socialism, and also subject to the education and training of more party cadres 
and the workers in socialist management and the students in science and engineering and other related fields in order to become the red experts in socialist construction. I see. Tito, the dictatorship of the proletariat is needed to safeguard socialist construction. It uses democratic centralism as a form of governance po, hindi ba? So could you discuss democratic centralism and how does it work and why is this type of leadership is important in paving the way to socialism? The dictatorship of the proletariat is upheld in the socialist constitution and is needed to guarantee the building of socialism and the continuance of socialist revolution and construction to achieve the ultimate goal of communism. With the Communist Party leading the socialist state in the form of the People's Democratic Republic, it follows and applies the principle and method of democratic centralism in making and implementing decisions. Democratic centralism is centralized leadership on the basis of democracy. The establishment of the facts, reports, and uh, recommendations come from the basic level of the party, the party branches, and the masses. Decisions move up from lower to higher levels of the party organs of leadership. Party organization and state organs for further consideration and decision making until they reach the central levels of party and state leading organs where decisions are taken in the making of national policies and plans. The policies and plans are carried out and tested in practice <clears throat> by the lower levels of the party, state and the people and on varied territorial scales. All the time, the party at all levels study and learn from the developing situation and is open to the reports, advice, criticism and supervision of the masses mm -hmm. and the allies among the people. The democratic basis for a centralized decision making never stops. I see. Tita, the, uh, the formula of unity, criticism, and then unity is the democratic method of resolving contradiction among the people. Po. So, Tito, can you give an example on how contradictions are resolved through this formula? In making criticisms, we should be motivated by a desire to strengthen unity and improve the work and style of work for the benefit of the people along the revolutionary line of socialism. A criticism is meant to advance the revolutionary work and struggle and bring about a higher level of unity among the people within the party and the socialist state. Criticisms arise when there are problems that need to be resolved because they are hampering or damaging revolutionary work and struggle. They are meant to present problems that must be analyzed and solved in order to improve the work and accelerate the advance of the revolutionary struggle. <clears throat> Criticisms can also arise from contradictions or problems on how to raise the level of development to a new and higher level. When criticisms are made, this must be subjected to discussion and the methods of analysis, reasoning, and persuasion are used. They therefore result both in the advancement of work and struggle and in raising the level of revolutionary consciousness and education. Raising the level of knowledge through criticisms and discussions means raising the level of practice. This is in accordance with materialist dialectics. I see. Tito, contradiction in a socialist society are fundamentally different from those in the old society, such as the capitalist society. So what are the basic contradictions in a, social, in a socialist society? In a socialist society, there are non-antagonistic class contradictions between the working class and the peasantry, and within each of these classes with regard to benefits and allocation of resources. There are also class contradictions between the proletariat and the urban petty bourgeoisie, and within the social stratum. Especially among the intellectuals, the culture of the old society and the international bourgeoisie can still exercise an influence on them. Within the Communist Party, there can be petty bourgeois elements who have not fully remolded themselves as communist and they are liable to express subjectivist and opportunist ideas. If not properly restricted and directed towards dissolution, the national bourgeoisie can enlarge its exploitative class interest 
and even seize power. It has been demonstrated in the rise of modern revisionism and subversion of socialist societies that the influence of the old exploitative classes can persist or be revived if the intelligentsia and the party cadres themselves do not engage in continuous proletarian revolutionary education concerning classes and class struggle and thus degenerate because they become alienated from the masses and become obsessed with, in, with increasing their pro bureaucratic privileges and emulating the international bourgeoisie. Tito, does exploitation still exist in a socialist society? And if ever, what kind of exploitation and how does it differ in an exploitation in a capitalist society? So Tito, and how do we gradually eradicate, no, eradicate exploitation? So far in history, socialism has arisen as a result of the struggle between armed revolution and armed counter-revolution in countries not as advanced economically as the most powerful imperialist powers. Thus, after the revolutionary proletariat overthrows the bourgeois state, it has to adopt transitory measures like the new economic policy in the Soviet Union from 1922 onwards and reform measures in China from 1949 onwards to give concessions to the lesser types of exploiters so that they can contribute to the quickest possible economic recovery instead of compelling them to flee or to do sabotage. The commanding heights of the economy like the landed states, strategic industries, the main sources of raw materials, and the principal means of transport and communications are immediately taken over by the state. But to revive and maintain the economy, concessions are made to certain elements in society that have an exploitative character, like the small and medium entrepreneurs and traders and the rich peasants. Concessions were given to these under the NEP in the Soviet Union until socialist industrialization and the cooperativization of agriculture were carried out through the series of five-year plans under Stalin. In China, concessions were also made to such lesser types of exploiters after the, the properties of big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists were confiscated. The national bourgeoisie was accommodated in joint state-private corporations in order to absorb its assets and redirect these to socialist construction. And capitalist rulers like uh, Liu Xiaoti, and uh, Deng Xiaoping wanted to prolong the concessions to the national bourgeoisie indefinitely. In fact, after the, of the defeat of the great proletarian cultural revolution, the Dengish capitalist oriented reforms and opening up to the world capitalist system restored capitalism in China and aggrandized the bourgeoisie as the ruling class. According to Mao Tito, counter-revolutionaries must be eliminated wherever found. Mistake must be corrected and whenever discovered. And what are the ways to eliminate counter-revolutionaries? Uh, indeed, counter-revolutionaries must be eliminated so that the socialist state is secure and consolidated. But the revolutionary party and the people must be judicious. Mm -hmm in carrying out the policy of eliminating the counter-revolutionaries. They must be arrested, detained, tried, and punished for criminal acts on the basis of evidence. The mass movement is necessary to isolate the counter-revolutionaries, but due process must be followed in trying and punishing proven counter-revolutionaries. The Communist Party, the state organs, and the people must be able to distinguish those who criticize and speak honestly against certain policies and actions and those who are really counter-revolutionaries. Mistakes must be avoided and when they occur, this must be corrected immediately and the victims must be rehabilitated. I see. Tito, with the rural population compromising the majority, no? the role of peasant has a most important bearing on the development of our economy and the consolidation of our state power. So Tito, China had successes in peasant cooperatives, for example. So, Tito, can you tell us what are the cooperatives and how important is this in building socialism? Uh, indeed, the peasants have a decisively important role in the development of the socialist economy and consolidation of state power. 
They are the majority of the people and are the main democratic force. And they are the producers at the agricultural base of the socialist economy, which ensures the food supply of the entire people and also provides major raw materials for light industry. Cooperativization is used by the socialist society to raise the level of economic and social development of agriculture and the peasant masses. Starting in 1952, the development of agricultural cooperatives went through three stages in China. The first stage was characterized by mutual aid teams involving the temporary sharing of labor and some capital by individual households as the basic unit of ownership and production. The mutual aid teams were further organized in 1954 into agricultural producers' cooperatives. The tools, draft animals, and labor were shared on a permanent basis. Cooperative members retained their land ownership but contributed this to a common uh, land pool. By the end of 1956, the transformation of mutual and uh, aid teams into agricultural cooperatives was completed. Most of the cooperatives had become advanced producers' cooperatives or collectives. The members of the cooperatives no longer earned personal income on the basis of shares of land owned. Instead, collective farm net income was divided among members mainly on the basis of labor contributions. The average cooperative was made up of 170 families and more than 700 people. The third stage of co cooperativization was the organization of the people's communes during the Great Leap Forward. The people's communes were successful in overcoming the imperialist embargo, the abandonment of economic projects by the Soviet Union, and the natural calamities. They fulfilled the objective of the Great Leap Forward in developing collectivized agriculture as the complement of socialist industry. And they also stimulated the growth of rural industries and capital construction in the rural areas. But the imperialists and the Dengis counter-revolutionaries attacked the Great Leap Forward as a complete disaster, despite the sustained high yield of the communes since the bumper crop of 1962. I see. Tito, in consolidating cooperatives, there are certain contradictions that remain to be um, resolved, such as those between the state and the cooperatives and those in and in between of the cooperatives themselves. So what are these and how do we resolve them? The Chinese socialist state recognized the uneven development of the cooperatives and differences in the productivity of advanced, middle, and backward cooperatives, and thus adjusted its tax and requisition policy accordingly. The purpose of the tax policy was to support state operations, assist the backward cooperatives, and the development of industry, and the requisitioning of agricultural products had the purpose of having sufficient stocks as raw materials for manufacturing, as well as sufficient food supply uh, to cover shortfalls due to natural disasters. The state made sure that the tax and requisitions allowed the peasant masses to improve agricultural production and raise their standard of living. The Communist Party and the Social State provided a direction, the planning and the financial and technical means for developing a certain level of cooperativization to a new and higher level. They also developed state farms. They made it a point to develop agriculture as the base of the socialist economy to produce food for the growing Chinese population and raw materials for light industry, even as the development of heavy and basic industries as the leading factor in the development of the entire socialist economy. Tito, what will happen to the landlords after the party uh, seized political power? And how about small landlords, landlords and rich peasants? After the Communist Party wins state power in a semi-colonial and semi-feudal country like China of the past and the Philippines at present, the People's Democratic Revolution is basically completed and the Socialist Revolution can begin. But the Communist Party proceeds 
at an accelerated rate to complete land reform as a bourgeois democratic measure in order to satisfy the peasant hunger for land and institute cooperativization as a socialist measure at the soonest possible time in connection with completing land redistribution to the landless peasants. The land of the landlords is confiscated for free distribution to the landless peasants. In the case of landlords who have not committed crimes and not violently opposed the revolution, they can be given the opportunity to have a source of livelihood and uh, live a comf comfortable life commensurate to their ability and education. The rich peasants can be given the opportunity to contribute their land and means of production to the cooperatives and become cooperative members according to the rules. Tito, in the building of socialist society, everybody needs remolding. The exploiters and also the working people. How do we ensure that the remolding of the bourgeoisie? And how about the intellectuals? Of course, the toiling masses of workers and peasants must continue to remold themselves. It is in their class interest that they raise the level of their revolutionary consciousness and activity in order to uphold, defend, and carry forward the socialist revolution and construction. It is their own duty to themselves, as well as the duty of the Communist Party to make sure that they further remold themselves through further revolutionary education and mass mobilization, especially because they own and control the instruments of production, education, and culture. It is a matter, of course, that those who belong to the exploiting classes of big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists are deprived of the right to be voted and to vote for others to public office, as well as of other civil rights that can allow them to regain political power. But if they have not committed crimes, they are tolerated, allowed to earn a living and own non-exploitative property, and they can opt to be educated to support socialism. The national bourgeoisie, the intellectuals, and the rich peasants are encouraged to remold themselves. There are study courses on socialism outside of the universities and in various places and fields of social activity. The educational system is required to provide socialist education to all the students at various levels. The mass media and so many types of cultural activities can be instruments of uh, socialist education and culture. What kind of contradictions need to exist with the national minorities and how should we resolve them? This is also important in the Philippines with a lot um, with uh, given a lot of national minor minorities are there. The national minorities have managed to retain their autonomy, ancestral domain and their cultural characteristics by resisting effectively previous social systems and regimes. The socialist state has to respect the right to self-determination, ancestral domain, and culture. It must give them the time and opportunities to raise their own level of economic, social, political, and cultural development. The national minorities occupy and live in large areas which are fertile and rich in natural resources. The socialist state should not be like the foreign corporations, the reactionary puppet state, and the local exploiting classes that grab the land and the natural resources from the national minorities. With their full knowledge and consent, the availment of the land and resources in their ancestral domain must benefit them first, ahead of the rest of the Filipino nation. I see, Tito. So, Tito, um, I quote, let a hundred flowers blossom and let a hundred schools of thought contend. And also, I quote, long-term coexistence and mutual supervision. What these slogans mean? According to Mao himself, literally, the two slogans, let a hundred flowers blossom and let a hundred schools of thought contend, have no class character. The proletariat can turn them to account and so can the bourgeoisie or others. Different classes, straight and social groups, each have their own views on what are fragrant flowers and what are poisonous weeds. Mm -hmm. The variety of schools of thought and works of art and culture can contend and flourish so long as the principles of China's socialist constitution 
is the basis and framework. The principles are as follows. One, words and deeds should help to unite and not divide the people of all our nationalities. Two, they should be beneficial and not harmful to socialist transformation and socialist construction. Three, they should help to consolidate and not undermine or weaken the people's democratic dictatorship. Four, they should help to consolidate and not undermine or weaken democratic centralism. Five, they should help to strengthen and not shake off or weaken the leadership of the Communist Party. And six, they should be beneficial and not harmful to international socialist unity and the unity of the peace-loving peoples of the world. Mao also explains long-term coexistence and mutual supervision in the following words. The slogan, long-term coexistence and mutual supervision is also a product of China's specific historical conditions. It was not put forward all of a sudden, but had been in the making for several years. The idea of long-term coexistence had been there for a long time. When the socialist system was in the main established last year, the slogan was formulated in explicit terms. Why should the bourgeois and petty bourgeois democratic parties be allowed to exist side by side with the party of the working class over a long period of time? Because we have no reason for not adopting the policy of long-term coexistence with all those political parties which are truly devoted to the task of uniting the people for the cause of socialism and which enjoy the trust of the people. I see. Uh, Tito, I think that ends our discussion on uh, uh, for today. Ano po. Um, I think we will now proceed to the question and answer portion. Uh, so we are opening our floor to our audiences. So if you, have do, if you do have questions in mind, don't uh, hesitate. Just drop your um, questions on our comment box so uh, Tito Jo could answer your, we could relate your questions to Tito Jo and he could answer it. While we are waiting for questions to be sent out, we are now again, as we know, last week is the International Human Rights Day and on the day on the Philippines, uh, the police, the Philippine National Police together with the uh, Crime Investigation and Detention Group with the power of war, uh, search arrest provided by Quezon City Trial uh, Quezon City Tri Regional Trial Court Judge uh, Cecilin Villabert um, arrested seven human rights activists, journalists, and um, uh, human rights workers ano po, by raiding their house and planting evidence as them. And now um, we know that the political the, the political persecution is uh, being being heightened in the Philippines. So we we call to our audiences and to our kasamas. To to um to speak and um to call the to call and free all political prisoners in the Philippines and uh, free internet uh, IHR seven uh, seven also free Amanda Echanis and Baby Randall Echanis. Um, we because of that we will now uh, watch a video from Outer Media um by that 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 will be provided by our tech. Sunod-sunod na pag sa iba't ibang probinsya at human rights groups nagsampan ng kaso sa ombudsman bilang pushback sa red tagging. Iyan ang mga ulat sa Atake Alert ngayong linggo. Sa bag-aw kagayan, pwersa ang hinuli ng mga pulis ang anak ng pinatay na peace consultant na si Randall Echanis. Madaling araw ng December 2 nang pasukin ng mga elemento ng 77th Infantry Battalion ng AFP, PNP at CIDG ang tinutuloyan ni Amanda Lacaba Echanis at Dinakip. Nakitaan daw siya ng isang M16 assault rifle at dalawang granada na ayon sa peasant groups ay hindi kapanipaniwala dahil kasama niya ang isang buwan niyang sanggol. Isang organizer ng mga magsasaka si Amanda gaya ng kanyang ama. Sa nagdaang mga buwan, paulit-ulit siyang inakusahan ng militar na mataas na opisyal daw ng CPP sa Cagayan. Halos kasabay ding nagsagawa ng raid ang mga elemento ng militar sa bahay ng isa pang leader magsasaka na nangunguna sa pagsasagawa ng relief effort sa Cagayan. Ayon sa mga saksi, Aabot sa isang daang katao ang sumira sa pinto at pwersa ang pinasok ang bahay ni Isabelo Adviento, nagtanim ng mga baril at granada sa sala ng kanilang bahay. Wala si Adviento na maganap ang raid pero pinasasa ng mga operatiba si Richard Dagohoy, kasapi ng Bagao Farmers Association na nasa bahay ni Adviento noong mga sandaling iyon. Si Adviento ay local coordinator ng anak Pawis Party List at leader ng grupong Dangayan. 
na regional chapter ng kilosang magbubukid ng Pilipinas sa Cagayan. Sa Lapu-Lapu City, hinuli ng mga pulis ang limang miyembro ng Centro at First Glory Apparel dahil sa pag-violate daw ng health protocols. Kasama ang mga manggagawa sa isinasagawang protesta malapit sa Mactan Export Processing Zone. Pinalaya ang mga manggagawa kinabukasan matapos magbayad ng multa. Sa Gihulngan City, Negros Oriental, pitong residente ang dinakip at dinala sa Cebu para ipresenta umano kay PNP Chief De Bold Sinas sa kanyang pagbisita doon. Kasama sa mga dinakip si Arlita Habalde, 62 anyos na nauna nang ipinalabas ng NTF LCAC bilang Rebel Surrendery noong Nobyembre. Ayon sa karapatan Central Visayas, ang pagdakip sa mga residente ay bahagi ng matagal ng modus operandi ng mga otoridad para makakuha ng pabuya sa tuwing may napipresenta silang surrendery. Sa Mexico, Pampanga, dinakit ng mga dinakilalang lalaki ang transport leader na si Jose Bernardino umaga ng December 4. Ayon sa mga saksi, nagpakilala ang mga lalaki bilang mga opisyal ng CIDG at may dalang limang sasakyan para kunin si Bernardino. Dinala ang transport leader sa Camp Olivas sa Pampanga. Nagsampa naman ng reklamo sa Office of the Ombudsman ang grupong karapatan laban sa red tagging ng mga opisyal ng NTFLK. Ayon sa grupo, hindi pwedeng walang managot sa umano'y peligroso at walang basehang mga akusasyong binabato sa mga kritiko ng gobyerno. Nakatakda rin maghain ng kaso laban sa NTFLK ang Alter Media Network at iba pang mga grupong ni Red Tag sa nagdaang Senate hearing. We're now back again to our MD line online. Um, now we will now proceed to our question and answer portion. Ano? Um, uh, I think there are already uh, questions sent to us by from our audiences. Uh, Tito, um, uh, I'm going to ask you the first question to our, from our audience. One, there, The first question would be, are cooperatives already being practiced even if the party has not uh, yet seized political power and also how about in the Philippine Revolution Sorry Tita I think you are on mute po Na naka-mute ka po Tito sorry Naka-mute po Oh uh, hello Ayan. All right, Tito, naririnig na po. Um, even before the victory, the total victory of the People's Democratic Revolution uh, in the Philippines, as in China, um, land reform and uh, cooperatives uh, are already um, uh, being created, no? But uh, upon seizure of uh, political power nationwide, the, uh, the state the People's Democratic uh, State would be in a better position to complete uh, the process of uh, land reform and uh, uh, undertake cooperativization. Uh, in the course of people's war, uh, you know, um, sometimes uh, uh, the uh, uh, control over certain areas uh, uh, gets passed on from one side to the other. Uh, Uh, but at any rate, it is clear uh, to the Filipino revolutionaries that even before the total victory, uh, it is possible to have uh, two kinds, two um, two kinds of plan reform. Uh, one is uh, the minimum, which means the distribution of land to the landless, wherever it is possible, and uh, the maximum is to carry out. Uh, Uh, cooperativization, but uh, in any case, uh, um, the the easiest uh, kind of cooperative to set up is uh, uh, the one uh, uh, that may be described as rudimentary, rudimentary cooperation, and it's still done on a household basis, um, and uh, a good neighborly cooperation of the of the households. In a particular village, um, there can be exchange of draft animals, 
or uh, 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 exchange of seeds and so on and so forth. There are various forms of cooperation uh, that are possible. Mm. Now, when uh, power is uh, seized, of course, it is easier uh, to carry out land reform on a nationwide scale. Uh, the expression used to complete the process of land reform and to carry out the uh, cooperativization in all its, its stages. So the, 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 in the case of the, uh, the Soviet Union, this was done uh, uh, to, uh, together with socialist industrialization from 1927 onwards, uh, 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 the collectives were formed. Uh, all over uh, the Soviet Union, and in the case of the of China, um, up to the communes, the, the, the third stage of the communes, the process of cooperativization um, developed. I see. All right, Tito. Second question that has been sent from our audience: Even before victory, there are a lot of contradictions within the party itself. How would you describe the contradictions in the Communist Party of the Philippines that led to mistakes rectified during the second Great Rectification Movement? And how should the party have handled the contradictions with the counter-revolutionaries as not to lead to such mistakes as in the past? Uh, you know, uh, the basic error that occurred uh, in the ideological field was subjectivism, it was a misinterpretation of the status of uh, uh, the Philippine economy. So some people said um, the Philippines was no longer semi-feudal and adjustments must, must be made in policy uh, so that uh, um, insurrection in urban areas um, could be launched uh, um, ahead of the prolonged process of developing uh, the uh, uh, revolutionary, the guerrilla fronts and the revolutionary base areas. So uh, up to the point of uh, uh, ideological uh, uh, dispute, there is no problem. Anyone is free in the party to uh, propose ideas, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that is subject to debate. Um, but uh, what is... Uh, as what you might call safely ideological debate, can go further into the application, into mm -hmm. the political and practical application. Uh, uh, because the uh, basic premise is that the Philippines was already capitalist and no longer semi-feudal. There was an, uh, a, de a um, uh, degradation uh, mm -hmm. or a bring down uh, of uh, uh, the line of uh, the strategic line of protracted people's war, which meant uh, um, engaging in uh, armed struggle in the countryside to accumulate armed and political power until the time is right to take power in the cities. Um, so uh, the errors would mean uh, would mean uh, uh, serious damage when. Uh, insurrectionary actions were taken um, and uh, it took the form of uh, using armed uh, city partisans to uh, 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 it, they, they, they were loosely used to attack even the uh, policemen without weapons traffic policemen and so on no? and worst of all the uh, in, insurrectionary urban insurrectionary spirit um, tended to uh, bring down the security measures for the underground personnel, and they came out uh, um, trying to uh, organize what they called people strikes. You know, and mm -hmm. many were exposed in Mindanao, and uh, the uh, enemy would be able to make uh, uh, effective counterattacks because they could identify the underground personnel. Now. Um, I think political and military errors, if honestly done, um, uh, can be handled uh, on time, no? uh, but they were not handled on time. Now, the biggest uh, error amounting to uh, criminality is, you know, uh, covering up the um, ideological and political causes 
and then uh, uh, blaming instead of analyzing mm -hmm. the wrong line in order to rectify it, um, uh, those responsible for the wrong line started to blame. Uh, to imagine that there were deep penet so many deep penetration agents, so they made up stories that uh, the enemy had already planted so many uh, deep penetration agents, and the point was to start uh, uh, is to carry out a witch hunt. No, um, so uh, many people were uh, uh, accused of being a DPA uh, for the slightest uh, uh, suspicion. And then um, the uh, due process was not followed in the investigation of, uh, of cases. And in the, uh, there was no due process also in the lack of uh, um, proper evaluation of evidence and uh, following correct procedures and prosecution and trial. So let's take uh, in Mindanao, which was uh, where the Campanian Ajos was the uh, worst form of criminality no? uh, that uh, resulted from the uh, ideological and political errors. 1,500 were uh, uh, arrested and um, estimates vary uh, from 300 to 800 uh, who were punished. And uh, upon investigation and during the rectification movement, uh, uh, most of those uh, cases where the people were uh, uh, suffering in detention and even the supreme punishment uh, uh, were not uh, properly uh, um, were not uh, were not properly uh, 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 processed mm -hmm. according to the law of the People's Democratic Government. No due process was followed, and uh, and silly ideas like oh a spy has no right. But you have to prove uh, mm -hmm. first that the spy, uh, that someone is a spy, no? You, you can just presume that somebody is a spy, just like the uh, military morons now are uh, doing. And they say, oh, you are a communist, and therefore you are a terrorist, and uh, we will do everything to, uh, to get you, plant evidence on you, arrest you, detain you, and uh, kill you as much as we, uh, we please. So um, it's... Uh, it's necessary for the uh, revolutionary movement to follow uh, the correct uh, principles and procedures of uh, uh, prosecuting um, uh, possible offenses. But you know, uh, you know, um, the wrong line uh, aroused uh, uh, suspicion that there were DPA because it was wrong. Uh, companies, uh, there were only 16 companies at the most, and um, they had, uh, um, and they were formed uh, at the expense of the small units that were closer to the masses, and they were easily seen by a, a enemy informers outside mm -hmm. of the movement, and uh, they, uh, it was quite expensive, costly to maintain those companies. So instead of ambushing the enemy, they were the, the ones being ambushed. And then um, there was also rapid recruitment. Uh, and um, the, the old body system was not used uh, for the veteran revolutionary fight, fighter uh, to be on the side of the, of the uh, raw recruit. No? Such things were not followed. So, um, as, so when people were being shot in the back, uh, oh, it must be the work, uh, the conclusion was made, it must be the work of DPAs. So anyway, um, the, the lessons were, were learned, and uh, the uh, second great ratification movement uh, um, uh, started to win victories. Uh, it was launched in 1992 by 1994, though those who were misled uh, uh, to follow the wrong line. Um, most of them uh, saw the light, and uh, if they separated themselves uh, from the movement, uh, they came back. Uh, and uh, by 1996, uh, the uh, revolutionary movement started to pick up in strength. Uh, you see, as a result of the uh, uh, 
ultra left error, uh, the, the military, the premature formation of, of uh, uh, so many companies at the expense of uh, smaller units linked to the masses, uh, the mass base uh, um, uh, of the revolutionary movement is shrunk by as much as uh, 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 forty percent, no, in many places, and in the worst cases, even sixty percent. But by nineteen ninety six to nineteen sixty eight, uh, the mass base was again uh, 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 put back to its uh, former level, uh, especially uh, by the end of uh, uh, before before uh, the twenty first century. And um, in Mindanao, uh, the uh, movement was able to capture a general in the field. No? So that was in 1998. So that was a manifestation of the uh, uh, advances that uh, the revolutionary movement in Mindanao um, uh, uh, were able to achieve. And uh, uh, the um, uh, because uh, the revolutionary forces in Mindanao learned their lessons well, uh, they would become uh, the uh, uh, sort of uh, the leading the leading forces no? uh, in the uh, nationwide process of people's war. So they learned their lessons well, uh, and they recovered, and uh, Mindanao would would become strengthened again as a um, as the uh, number one uh, force in terms of people's war and other uh, aspects of the revolutionary struggle. I see. All right, Tito, let's proceed naman to the third question. Ano? Uh, in rebuilding the economy as a still largely agriculture, what should be the balance between developing agriculture and building industries? In my... Uh, uh, Earlier in the initial questions, uh, I did not mention that uh, uh, Mao and China learned from the experience of the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, uh, during the time of Stalin, uh, there, were, there was too much imposition on the peasants, uh, too much was taken for them uh, to support industrialization. And so learning from that experience, Mao said, uh, agriculture must be the base of the economy, and there must be something that should be, that should uh, that, that should be the bridge between agriculture and uh, uh, building uh, the the heavy and basic industries as the lead factor. Of course, to make socialism, you have to build uh, uh, the industries, but you have to have light industry, um, which uh, uh, gives the peasants. Uh, immediate returns for what they contribute to the national economy. That means to say um, the, the peasant deliver the food supply to the entire country. Now for light industry, they provide raw materials, you know, uh, product, agricultural products that are turned into, you know, manufactured uh, food products. And also the light industry produces uh, producer goods like irrigation pumps and so on and so forth. So the light industry can deliver to the peasants immediately what the peasants need in terms of consumption and production. And there is no big gap. Huh? Uh, if uh, there were no uh, light industry as the bridging factor. And of course, um, uh, there must be um, there must be calculated steps so that, you know, the drive to have uh, um, heavy and basic industries as the leading factor will not take too much, too much uh, capital, uh, too much resources at the expense of the peasants. Um, and uh, uh, as much possible, uh, the, more, uh, the more important agricultural machines could be produced by, uh, uh, by the uh, leading industries, uh, tractors and so on, are produced by them. So as soon as possible, uh, it, they must also, uh, the, uh, the heavy and basic industries must also deliver uh, the tractors to the peasants. 
So there, there is a, an orchestration of interest here with no sector uh, suffering uh, from the relationship. Um, and, but uh, the, the brilliant idea here is you know, making light industry as the, as the immediate bridge. And um, uh, there is immediately a, a guide that not too much should be taken from the peasants um, because uh, uh, there would be uh, the reactionaries in the countryside would take advantage of that. And um, um, there would be, as in the Soviet Union, there would be resistance by the rich peasants and they would mislead the, the other peasants. So China did not have uh, that kind of problem because they were able to um, uh, to develop agriculture and did not take too much out of the uh, what the peasants produce. Uh, the peasants, like the workers in uh, the city, uh, uh, had uh, uh, the opportunities, the resources, and the opportunities to raise their level of production and uh, uh, their living standard. Um, there was a, there was a, uh, of course, in socialist society, in, in so, the socialist economy, there may be a contradiction between the, the peasants and uh, workers. Workers normally has, uh, have higher wages, while the income of the peasants um, by the same measure would have less. But you see, uh, it's not just because uh, agriculture uh, has, a, uh, for a time, uh, has a lower level of development, it's because um, the means of subsistence in the countryside is cheaper, whereas uh, in the cities, um, the cost of the means of subsistence are higher. No? So uh, there is a, an evening up, uh, higher wages for the workers and more uh, uh, and also more uh, services. Uh, that's because the workers produce uh, uh, goods of a higher value. But then uh, there is an evening up because in the countryside, uh, the means of uh, subsistence are cheaper, but eventually these contradictions would be would be settled when the economy as a whole would develop and the uh, and the level of uh, of uh, development of agriculture and industry uh, uh, would uh, uh, come together, no? Instead of uh, there being a big gap, as in the old society. All right, Tito, before we proceed to the next question, ano, I just, uh, and while we are still um, waiting for the questions to come in, I think from our audience, I'm just going to plug in the foreign language press in which a online store of uh, revolutionary and progressive books, which you can find a lot of works there. If you could visit uh, flpress.storenv.com, uh, there is a selection from, um, uh, from, Mao uh, selected works, also Stalin, uh, Stalin's ideas. Um, uh, there are also uh, Marx and Lenin's um, books in that, also uh, from uh, revolutionary ideas from India and other progressive countries. No, um, so if you could just visit flpress.storenv.com. You could. Uh, there's a wide range of varieties of books that you could uh, choose, ranging from like five dollars to ten dollars. It's really cheap, and it uh, it also helps um, activists in the Europe to um, uh, you know uh, to actually uh, provide to get to get income. You know? So uh, I think Tito, we can uh, proceed now to our third question, po Tito. Um, yeah. All right. I see. Tito, para sa ating third, uh, sa ating fourth question pala, ano, it, this is from a question from Ash Sulaiman. Ano po ang pagtanaw ng Marxista sa antas o kalibre nyo po ukol sa konsepto ng afterlife? At saka po, ano po ang kahulugan nito sa tamang pamumuhay ng bawat tao? 
Dito? Uh-oh. Apa? May tanong? Sagot ka na, sagot ka na. Yung fourth question. Um, uh, ganito, no? Tagalog yung uh, tanong, no? <laughs> sagot sa... Uh, yung afterlife, uh, uh, does not bother me, um, uh, Marxist, like uh, uh, Einstein and uh, Stephen Hawking uh, are not bothered by the afterlife. Or to put it another way, um, yung kwan, we are not bothered uh, by the question of uh, there being a, a, a supernatural being, uh, uh, because if such a supernatural being is so good, no, and um, uh, he will not punish you for not believing that he does not exist, if he really exists, no. So in other words, uh, he he must be that supernatural being must be a fair, must be uh, uh, if he's a good guy, he will not uh, uh, punish you just because uh, he, a person has not gotten enough evidence. That he exists, no. Now um, uh, Einstein and Stephen Hawking, Haw- uh, Hawking uh, agree that the important thing is to make this life, uh, uh, this life, uh, as um, as good as possible. As uh, as uh, in this life, one must be able to do as much possible. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, for the benefit of the people, no, and uh, you can add uh, uh, for the good of the environment because you know with so much abuse by monopoly capitalism, the conditions of life uh, uh, are being destroyed, no. So uh, and with regard to religion, let's enlarge the question. Uh, Marxists do not advocate. Uh, elimination of religion. You will notice that on co- the correct handling of contradictions. Um, uh, like Engels said before, uh, he, because he he, ber- he berated and scolded during for proposing even the elimination of uh, of religion. Um, if uh, the scientific view, the Marxist-Leninist scientific view, is really valid, um, why uh, why why can't it allow religion? To fade away, to die out, instead of uh, instead of trying to eliminate it, because you know there is one good thing in religion for some people. If uh, um, if by adhering to a certain faith uh, they become uh, better persons than otherwise, mm-hmm. uh, why why not? Uh, the Catholic Church itself, uh, since uh, the 1960s. After adopting the uh, um, modern constitution of the church, uh, have tried to adjust uh, to the modern world, and um, it has agreed even to dialogue and cooperate with non-believers. And uh, you have now uh, uh, Pope Francis occasionally saying that uh, 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 communists are the best. Are, are uh, are, are, are real Christians. So, you know, uh, when the exploitative character of religion um, drops out because of the uh, changes in historical conditions, it can be, a, it, it, it should enjoy the freedom of thought and belief. Huh? Uh, it would be too, too artificial just to knock it down. Uh, and why knock it down when it has uh, not become uh, when, when, whereas it has uh, dropped its oppressive and uh, exploitative uh, character. The church now is so much different from uh, medieval and feudal times when it had so much power and it would carry out the Inquisition and so on and so forth. But the, the, the church has learned how to live with non-believers. And um, so uh, there, is, there are the Christians for national liberation. In the um, um, in the Philippine Revolutionary Movement, in the uh, they are an important uh, force uh, within the National Democratic Front, and uh, that they um, um, that they fit and uh, um, act for the good of the people, and uh, that's a, a, a good uh, sign that in the socialist society they can continue to exist. Uh, you see, uh, 
Mao said uh, the last struggle for a communist is for when he ages and he becomes sick, no? <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> he has to uh, be good to his upbringing as a child, you know. He, 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 can, uh, he can be sort of tempted to go back to his religion. But then, uh, as I said, if, um, uh, if God is love or is a, someone who, can, who is uh, reasonable and just, uh, why fear him? And that he will torture you in hell simply because you don't believe in his existence, you know. Uh, but there are people whom you must respect because religion is a comfort when they're in pain, they're in suffering, and about to die. And you must give them that. Uh, uh, you must give them that benefit, you know. Uh, you have relatives who believe in religion, and even when they're dying, they need the comfort, no, of. Uh, of uh, religion and uh, and the priest if he is around, no. So uh, it's no longer when the church ceases to be an obstruction uh, to social justice. I think it can be allowed. Uh, and uh, you know the un uneven development of things will continue even in communist society. I, I suppose in the communist society there will be still those who would believe in God. And uh, uh, there's no problem if they do not uh, oppress and exploit the people and uh, under the conditions of communism, there is no more oppression. There is no more, uh, there are no more classes that uh, systematically uh, oppresses, oppress and exploit the people. So, and that should be the, um, I hope uh, I make clear what's the viewpoint of the Marxist, um, not to, you know, not to worry so much. The important thing is uh, doing what you can in this life and tolerating people who believe that they are, they are better by uh, having some religious faith. I see. All right, Tito, we have a fifth question naman. Ano? Uh, how does the party handle individual internal contradiction, for example, letting go of petty bourgeois culture, also mental health problems? Hmm. Um, yes, there are, uh, in your question, there are two types of internal problems, political and psychological. I think the psychological problem should be dwelt, dealt with by the proper uh, psychological counselors or even the psychiatrists. Um, uh, uh, imbalances, mental imbalances, uh, 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 can be dealt with scientifically. And uh, there must be understanding for people who uh, become mentally sick, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I know we have no problem with, the, with Duterte as a mentally sick man, no? We have a problem with Duterte when, uh, when he, uh, he commits crimes yeah, against the people uh, because he's mentally and morally sick, no? Um, but people who are uh, sick by themselves need, uh, yeah, Medical care, the proper medical care. When it comes to political contradictions, there is no substitute for um, raising the level of consciousness. Um, a, a guy who is confused, um, especially because he becomes, especially before, uh, before he becomes uh, a communist, well, it's the job of the cadre and the a communist party member to to know the what are the problems and uh, how to analyze the problems and uh, fix the guy uh, so that he can become uh, 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 he can become uh, uh, productive and militant no? uh, as an activist. Now he, even a communist, uh, uh, even someone who has become a communist can sometimes be afflicted by um, internal contradictions with regard to all sorts of questions, political, economic, and philosophical, and so on. And uh, the job of those uh, who, are so, who, who are supposed to know better, like his collective huh, and uh, unit, should be, be able to assist the guy. And he will be very thankful if uh, uh, things are clarified and uh, 
he gets to understand um, um, what is the uh, how to uh, uh, solve the contradictions uh, in his mind or in his uh, activity. So, um, uh, political contradictions can be uh, resolved by uh, political and uh, ideological means, and uh, um, those with uh, mental problems, they can be, uh, those afflicted with them can be uh, treated uh, medically. So how about the man handling uh, members who have lumpen tendencies? Joy, the next question. Ah, well, uh, uh, by uh, uh, lumpen tendencies, uh, uh, the implication is that the tendencies uh, have a um, uh, criminal character, and uh, one does not have to come from uh, the urban poor areas to be the lumpen of proletariat, no? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, uh, lumpen suggests that you are... Um, a uh, cast off or a cast away of the proletariat and uh, you are likely to be used by the enemy or you engage in criminal activities and uh, that disqualifies you from uh, uh, from uh, uh, having uh, a uh, uh, reasonable kind of relations with the proletariat or uh, so much more you cannot be a revolutionary and uh, uh, this, uh, the lumpen proletariat, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the, the class enemy really knows how to make use of the poor, be they a proletariat or peasant, against, uh, against the proletariat and the peasants. Uh, because uh, poor people have to have a job, so uh, the military rec uh, recruits from the ranks of the poor. So in the Philippines, more uh, most of the ordinary soldiers come from the peasantry and from the uh, urban poor. And um, um, sometimes the expression lumpen proletariat uh, uh, is used to uh, refer to those who should be acting for the benefit of their uh, uh, exploited classes of origin, but who work eh, for uh, the exploiting classes through their service in the military. But uh, the most common uh, reference is, you know, the most common meaning to the term lumpen proletariat is criminal elements in, uh, in urban areas are uh, utilized by the enemy for counter-revolutionary purposes. And that this has been the um, that this has been the most uh, often uh, uh, used meaning of the term lumpen proletariat, and that explains why, um, let's say, even the fascists uh, uh, could uh, try by recruiting uh, the lumpen proletarian elements. Um, uh, the their low level of consciousness and their criminal tendencies. Uh, and activities are availed of by the worst representatives of the exploiting classes. Um, Hitler made use of the Lumpen proletariat to fight the proletariat. And uh, that's the usual track of, uh, of fascist uh, uh, leaders. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, you don't even have to come from the uh, from the ranks of the poor. You can come. You can be the son of a governor like Duterte, and you pose as a lumpen proletarian. And don't you see that he acts like a gangster, uh, a canto boy, and uh, that's how he tries to uh, present himself as a natural. You know? 
uh, a natural killer, a natural, uh, uh, natural, uh, natural swindler. <laughs> so, uh, he acts like the, the street boys. And uh, uh, it's, a, it's an imitation huh, of the real lumpen proletarians. And uh, Duterte uh, is, a, is a poseur huh, in being a lumpen uh, proletarian. I see. All right. Tito, um, yeah, I think that has been um, our last question sent from our audience. Oh, wait, may humahabol pa tito. Um, is there any other form of leadership that is effective for a communist party aside from a democratic centralism? No, uh, there is no other way because, you know, um, actually it uh, applied to uh, state leadership uh, actually is another expression for republicanism. There, there is a system of representation from level to level. And in the Communist Party, um, it is also, uh, that's also the case. Uh, there is a, you know, in uh, uh, parliamentarism, and peop uh, the delegates to parliament are supposed to be elected by the people. And so, um, uh, there is some uh, claim uh, to uh, uh, democracy and uh, representation. Uh, in the case of, uh, of of democratic centralism in the uh, in the Communist Party, the demand for centralized leadership is important because um, the timely decisions have to be made. But uh, the decisions can only arise. Because, because of the long-term uh, support of, the, uh, of democracy to uh, uh, centralized leadership. And uh, not only long time, there is also timely uh, support uh, in that uh, a good uh, uh, Communist Party leadership at a certain level must uh, refer, uh, must use the lower level to provide it with the facts and the forces for uh, acting or on certain problems and on certain goals to be achieved. So um, uh, there is a balancing of centralized leadership and the democratic base. Um, <laughs> some may even say it, it looks like the it, it looks like the structure of a corporation, no? Or uh, it looks like. Uh, uh, it looks like uh, uh, yeah, you have that kind of structure in the, in any corporation or in the church, no? Uh, but the big difference is the essence of democratic centralism is Marxism and the uh, revolutionary line. Uh, so um, uh, decision, the most uh, decisions are uh, undertaken. Uh, decisions are made in accordance with Marxist principles and revolutionary principles. Uh, that's the difference of democratic centralism as uh, used by the Communist Party from other uh, structures of leadership. Uh, so <laughs> I must make myself clear when it comes it comes only into structuring, there is even similarity, you know. Uh, with uh, uh, the bourgeois corporations or even the church as a corporation. But uh, the, the most essential difference is that democratic centralism um, uh, 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 in the Communist Party uh, is bound uh, by adherence, by the, by the theory and practice of Marxism and uh, the objective of social revolution. I see. All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, that has been the last question, Tito, that is sent to us from our audience. I think we are now closing our question and answer. You know? Thank you so much again, Tito, for, um, th for teaching us today with, this, uh, with the topic of Mao on handling, uh, on correct handling of contradiction among people. Natapos na naman po ang isang discussion sa mga kasama. Uh, I think next week we, we, still, we, we are still continuing this Mao series. So stand by 
for the next discussion uh, same time and same place no uh, on anak bayan europa if if you have missed some part of this you can always look back by going to our page anak bayan europa make sure to note this on your calendars and kita kits po tayo next week dito lang sa nd line online no huwag kalimutang i-like at i-share at mag-imbita pa ng mga kasamang sasali para sa makabuluhan at nakamumulat na talakayan dito lang sa National Democratic Line Online School Series with Tito Joe. Tito Joe, before we close, uh, may uh, message po ba kayo to our audience? Uh, Nangalahati na tayo sa ating serye. So uh, that's a good sign that we are advancing. And uh, I hope that uh, you will be with us, everyone uh, uh, who is uh, uh, involved in the uh, Mao Serie will uh, uh, continue uh, to participate uh, until the end of the Serie. I see. All right, Tito. Uh, again, muli maraming salamat po sa pakikibahagi. Ako po si Kasamang Christ. Kasama po si Prof. Joma. Mapagpalayang uh, hapon po, gabi po para sa amin lahat. Magiging mo